is the Vintage RPG Podcast, your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs, with your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me today is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com, Stu Horvath. No jokes today, folks. What we are going to talk about is the passing of a legend in the world of role-playing games. Greg Stafford passed away last year, October the 11th, 2018. And what we want to do today is break from format a little bit and kind of give you a remembrance of Greg Stafford. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic on to Stu Horvath. Man, I'm still bummed about this. Yeah. I love D&D. It's the blue jeans of RPGs. Right. You know, you can't get away from it. But I love Chaosium and all of its products more. (laughs) Like, I feel like that's the thing that's always really scratched my itch and really kind of expanded what I thought RPGs could be. And all of that is essentially down to Greg Stafford. It was his company. He started off really early looking into game design in the the mid-70s. And he bought one of the first D&D box sets. Really? Yeah, through a friend. A friend was picking something up at the print house that Gygax was getting them printed at or was printing materials. He was like, hey, you know, my buddy likes this stuff. You know, can I get one for him? So there's sort of like this idea myth, really, that he bought the first D&D box set, which I think is really great. That's super cool. Really kind of puts him right in the moment of the inception of this whole hobby. That's how far back he goes. His first major product was a tactical war game called White Bear and Red Moon, which was set in this magical world called Glorantha, which was a fantasy world that he sort of started creating when he was about 17, 18 as just sort of an intellectual exercise. And when he got into wargaming, he set this board game there. And it's this incredible, I'm not a really big wargame person. This isn't like a board game. It's not really, you know, an exercise in fun the way that I feel like modern board games are. This is, you know, a very large scale military engagement with a lot of rules, a lot of simulation, a lot of area and different types of troops and stuff. The thing about it that's sort of amazing, though, is that it's set in this world that's so ridiculously rich for a war game. (laughs) You know, there was nothing like this at the time. And the people were so interested in the lore and mythology of this world. It's a two-player game, and you're kind of constantly pulling out new gotcha things that are in the rules, and you could apply them in different ways, and it's a very dynamic, surprising game. And people were so interested in this that fans approached him and said, we should make a tabletop role-playing game out of this. Thus, we got RuneQuest, which is sort of the second biggest fantasy role-playing game, in my estimation. You could say that Tunnels and Trolls is maybe it. But I think that RuneQuest is the first skill-based system. It's the first tabletop role-playing game that has its own campaign setting. It wasn't 100% dedicated to Glorantha, but it was mostly set in Glorantha. And this is in 1979, 1980, you know, years and years and years before you get Forgotten Realms. Right. So there's just so much just right there, skill-based and a campaign setting, rich campaign setting. Man, I'm still bummed about this. (laughs) It's okay, man. I mean... (laughs) I could imagine this is the equivalent of it's it's almost like a second Gygax. Yeah. In a lot of ways where, you know, I remember how upset people were when Gary Gygax died. Because that was he was the guy. I mean, he was he he was essentially the great Oz and the great yeah. Oz had finally left this plane. So I I'm not shocked to see that there's a similar outpouring of Sadness for Greg Stafford. Yeah. So with RuneQuest, he founds this company that uses RuneQuest as a basis for a house system. Basically, every other Chaosium game in some way comes from RuneQuest. Call of Cthulhu is a modified version of it. Pendragon, which we'll talk more about. The Stormbringer game. All of them draw from this idea of the basic role-playing system, which is a stripped-down RuneQuest. Right. So... All of Chaosium's games are rooted in Greg's design work with Glorantha, which supports RuneQuest, and it all sort of pours out, and Chaosium just constantly puts stuff out over its history that people imitate and innovate on. So they're this huge 
vortex of tabletop role playing creativity that that gets disseminated out as people see these new ideas. They take them and they do different things with them. It all started with Greg Stafford's little board game, which is not that little, but you know. <laughs> I did a little research on it. The name Chaosium mm-hmm. was pretty much it's fun. He lived near the Oakland Coliseum, so he combined the word Coliseum with the word chaos, and thus Chaosium was born. (laughs) I feel like that's a very identifiable decision. (laughs) Sometimes it doesn't have to be that hard. Yeah. So Chaosium is like his company. Everything that comes out of Chaosium is his fault, and it's kind of wonderful. But one of the things that he worked on early, and I I just think that this is so weird, and we've talked about this in a previous podcast, is he took the Chaosium team and then the, him and Sandy Peterson, and they went to West End Games and developed the Ghostbusters game. Right. Which forms the basis of the Star Wars game, which is one of the first sort of stripped down cinematic style role playing games. So he, <laughs> the one game he designs for somebody else sort of spins off into this other wildly influential game. And so he had the Midas touch for game creation. Yeah. In 89, he puts out Prince Valiant, which is a license off of the newspaper comic strips. What? Real? Prince Valiant? Yeah. yeah. Like, like the Prince Valiant. Like I every Sunday in my newspaper, Prince Valiant. Yep. Yep. So Who the yeah. hell would want to play that? Well, that that's the, <laughs> it is kind of like a, what do you, it's, it's like an old person's comic, right? You know, I, I never really read it, but you have to, I always like looked at it because the pictures are pretty, but it's a King Arthur style setting. Right. And basically it's the first real formal storytelling game. There's no dice mechanic. There's a couple of skills and attributes and you resolve everything with coin tosses. It's the simplest system in the world. And it's all about, you know, telling stories together. And again, it's something that he talked about with a friend of his. That friend goes on and founds White Wolf Publishing and boom. That's amazing. Yeah. So like, Prince Valiant didn't even do that well, but because he was talking to people about it, the people who mattered, the right people are talking about it. And out of this, you get Vampire the Masquerade and the whole World of Darkness line. It's not a one-for-one thing, but you could see that influence there. And without Prince Valiant, you don't get that. I just can't wrap my head around the jump from Prince Valiant to Vampire the Masquerade. <laughs> I mean, it's not, It's uh, thematically, it's a very different game. But the principles of the storytelling system and the ideas of a storytelling game, you got to remember that you were in an arms race in the 80s of making the more complicated game. Like, p- the perception of a role-playing game, of its seriousness, was directly connected to its complexity, which is nonsense. It's such garbage idea. And so right when it's at its height of this complexity race, Stafford is like, no, let's like make a game about coin tossing <laughs> and just stripping it down to the idea of let's make a game about telling stories together. Which is interesting because you're talking about the complexity of these games. Like you were in the race to make the more complex game. I definitely look back at that time and feel as if it wasn't very inclusive back then for people to play these kinds of games because the people who would want a game that's more complex aren't looking to play it with just anybody. Yeah, you have to play it with other people who can handle a really complex game, and that's a certain amount of gatekeeping, right? Exactly. Because you need X number of not I don't want to say years, but you have X number of systems worth of experience that you get to these, you know, these graduated complex right. systems. You're at least a brown belt gamer. Yeah, exactly. And Prince Valiant didn't do well, you know, yeah. because of the climate at that moment in time. But the legacy is there. I think I think it's a really super important game because out of that storytelling idea, you get all of the indie games, the story games, the stuff like Fiasco, all of that stuff was, you know, I don't want to call Prince Valiant, you know, the zero moment for it, but it is a formative foundational system for story games, which is a huge movement right now in terms of diversifying the people playing role-playing games. Which is the bipolar opposite of exclusivity is storytelling games right now. Everyone can play them. Anyone can get involved. You know, you're looking at things like Tales from the Loop. You're looking at, you know, our friend's game, Rememrex. You're looking at the different games that you got those one sheet games from the back of world champ where you could just sit down. You've never played a game before, but you've seen a movie you've watched on TV, you read some books, you can play this game. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. And it's about, you know, reducing the barrier to entry, you know, like 
Prince Valiant uses a coin toss, you know, and since then, story games, you have story games that don't have GMs. You have story games that run diceless, just getting rid of all of the impediments, which is something that Greg, for years, really wanted the Glorantha game to reflect that. And out of that eventually came Robin Law's Hero Quest, which we we flirted with a little bit. Right. And you could see how that was, that's sort of an advanced storyteller game where everything is based on those keywords, right? So like... Hambone, your character would be like, you would have the skilled podcasting engineer and you would get all of the stuff that, you know. That's my thing. That's my wheelhouse. <laughs> and this is not to be, for those listening at home, confused with the Milton Bradley hero quest. No. So hero questing has always been a core concept of how mythology and Glorantha works. Maybe we should probably talk about Glorantha for a bit. Glorantha is crazy. Crazy. There is, <laughs> there is nothing in tabletop role-playing like Glorantha. I've never experienced... You've seen the guide to Glorantha on my shelf. It's magnificent. It's gigantic. And, and it's big. There's so much stuff, and it's all so well thought out. That Don't get me wrong. He created it, and lots of other people have contributed to it. But you could tell that he was sort of a mediating force in it. It all feels very consistent, and I think it's down to Stafford. He always maintained a certain amount of ownership and control over it. Right. That's one of the things that really bums me out, because like it's still a shared universe, but it won't have that, that guiding hand. Well, in a lot of ways, and you can correct me if I'm ri- wildly wrong with this, I see a lot of that in you and the way that you run in Winnable. Now, 10, uh, ten years ago? Uh, eight. Eight years ago, you started in Winnable, and there's been a lot of people who have come, a lot of people have gone, a lot of people have given their input and ideas, but you always have that touch. You always yeah. have your finger on the pulse of it. So you are, in a lot of ways, doing what Greg Stafford did. You created the world, and now other people are adding to yeah. it. Yeah, you maintain the voice, there the consistency go. of the voice. Glorantha is just crazy. I don't really like lore. Like in video games, like lore is the thing that interests me least. The huge exception for me is Glorantha because the lore is so interesting and not just lore. It's the world. It's the game. It's how you, it's the things that you investigate. Mythology, the gods are alive in Glorantha and you could actually reenact their myths through what is called hero questing. It's always been called that. Right. RuneQuest didn't have a a system for it in game terms because it was concerned with, you know, simulating the real world. And HeroQuesting is a metaphysical thing. So when HeroQuest, the game originally called Hero Wars, and then Milton Bradley let the board game trademark slide. Right. So Stafford bought it. Smart man. And named his game what he wanted it to be named, which was HeroQuest. Because it's built with words, it becomes a vehicle for metaphysical or shamanistic kind of exploration of mythology. And I think that that's, uh, I just, I, it, it blows my mind because lore is something that people just get into. And, you know, there, there's, there's like a right way or a wrong way and you argue about it. And it's just like, and none of it really matters. Right. right. Like comic book continuity, like who cares? Right. Just tell me a good story. Yeah. And you can, and there's a certain amount of fun that you could derive from it, but I can't think of anything in which uh, you play a game where the lore is so integral to the experience. And the more you learn about that lore, the richer the game becomes, you know? Right. You know, I understand that completely because it's rare nowadays that you get enveloped in something that the lore is so important. I mean, look at Harry Potter. The lore was super important in that. I mean, I'm on, what, season 14 of Supernatural? The lore is important. However, in other game playing engines and different types of games, you're right. The lore can kind of bog you down a little bit. Yeah, it's it's besides the point usually. However, you know, I've seen that Glorantha book. I opened it up and I sat there waiting for you to come into games one night, and I'm I'm overwhelmed by it because in the first like 10, 15 pages, it's just so rich. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous. It's so well thought out in its present, where you know a lot of times you will look through a book and the art is cool, but it's just art and not discounting the work of the artist. However, it's it's just there. It's it's there to kind of take up a page that doesn't have words on it. Whereas the Glorantha book, holy crap, 
When I was a kid, we would get like these Reader Digest books or, uh, you know, like Mysteries of the Past or whatever. And it would oh, just be like, great. sort of like world history, but filtered through like the spooky-ish, you know, like like Mysteries of the Unknown or like In Search Of. And I feel like that's sort of the vibe that Glorantha gets. It feels like this secret history, like a time life book chronicling a world that you've never heard of. And I just think it's so rich and delicious. I came to it late too, for whatever quirks of the way things were marketed around here. I never saw RuneQuest. I knew it existed, but as a kid, I just never saw it in bookstores. It was, we just weren't in the market. I saw Call of Cthulhu stuff, also from Chaosium, but I never saw the RuneQuest. I never saw RuneQuest anywhere. No. You know, in a past episode, I definitely talked about how, you know, say with Dragon Magazine, you would see it. I would see it in the bookstores. Yeah. You know, you'd see some D&D books in the bookstores. You'd see some Forgotten Realms novels, so many novels. Glorantha, RuneQuest is something that even... Five years, now I started playing games when I was 25. Five, seven years into my playing RPGs, I still hadn't gotten wind of RuneQuest or Glorantha or anything outside of what d and I was playing at the time. Yeah, I tend to think that because we are of the time that's pre-internet, because we are of the time that is, you just saw what was in the store that was closest to your house. Yeah. Obviously, we missed out on a lot of stuff. You know, you went back and you went nuts on the eBay and <laughs> and you found all this stuff. However, I kind of look at it as a gift in a lot of ways because now you're coming to it later in life and you come to it with a appreciation that maybe you would not have had had it been the first thing that come to you. I totally agree. I have read just about all the published material of Glorantha that exists in the world. And I've read it in the last two or three years. And it was hard work. It's complicated, but it was such a gratifying experience to be able to learn about it, get interested in it, hunt it down without it not costing an arm and a leg, and getting all of it and being able to just take it all in. My exploration of Glorantha has been one of the most satisfying things in my tabletop role-playing history. I can't wait until we play RuneQuest or Hero Quest seriously when we're old men. That's going to be fantastic. <laughs> I definitely, definitely look forward to it. So do you have any more thoughts on Greg Stafford? I do. And it's a big one. Let it out. Pendragon. Pendragon. Pendragon is not for everyone. You got to understand, going into what I'm about to say, that you might not like Pendragon if we were to play it. You might not even like reading about it. It's about King Arthur. It's a very deep dive into the romantic poetry that King Arthur came out of. And it is an attempt by Stafford to make a unified role-playing timeline of the King Arthur romances, right? Okay. That could be fun. That could be boring. For me, I think that Pendragon is the greatest role-playing game ever created. Well, you heard it here first, <laughs> folks. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. It is such a super specific thing. Again, you have to keep in mind, this isn't a King Arthur role-playing game. This is a romantic medieval poetry role-playing game in which you're creating characters who reflect the morals of the day. And you're playing through adventures in the Arthurian timeline, testing those characters. And the way that he designed the system you have a bunch of traits. It's basically your seven deadly sins and your seven cardinal virtues, and they're on a sliding scale. And the more good you do, the less you know gluttonous you are. The way the system works is a just a perfect, absolutely perfect reflection of the material and the core of it. It just synthesizes so well. I don't think you can make a game that marries all of these things, theme, source material, and system, the way that Pendragon does. It's beautiful. Forget the arcane bits of like the King Arthur poetry stuff. Just take it as granted and read the Pendragon rules and look at how the great Pendragon campaign works. And on a game design level, I just think that there is nothing better. I think that it was a masterpiece. And I don't think that it will be easy for anybody to batch it. That's impressive. It is. We should really play that. All right. We're going to put it on the list. We're going to give Pendragon a roll 
if you will. <laughs> there are there are dice in this game, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rune quest <laughs> derivative. So it's all percentiles and skill based. The Great Pendragon campaign is literally from the reign of Uther, King Arthur's dad, until a couple years after King Arthur's death. So it, it ranges like ninety years. Each session is supposed to be about a year. So it's a ninety session game. That's that's wow. only like eight years of play. Yeah, <laughs> the way we play. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll be uh, at the Sizzler yeah. on our jazzies. It's a massive undertaking. I can't get over the amount of work and ingenuity that he put into it. It really takes my breath away reading it. And you should check it out just on a, even if you don't want to play it, just if you love games, if you love systems and tabletop role play games, you owe it to yourself to give it a read. It's often hard to eulogize a person that you don't know personally. That said, artists leave behind a body of work. And Greg Stafford is no different. There is a plethora of different books and games you could dive into to not just have some fun with your friends, but really understand the man behind those books. And I highly recommend that you do it. Do you have any final thoughts on Greg Stafford before we wrap this up, Stu? I think that my parting thought is that thousands of people have played in worlds that Greg Stafford created. And I can think of no better legacy for a man who makes games. Well put, Stu. Folks, this was our Greg Stafford retrospective. Next time, we will be back with our regularly scheduled programming. And until then, for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hampon McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 